Hello, so my name is Christophe de Dinchin. I'll try to say that three times fast. I, I hope you, you learned since this morning. And uh, so I'm working for Red Hat. Nobody knows what I do there because I don't know myself. Vaguely working on confidential computing. And today I'm going to try to show how to go from a confidential computing host all the way to the workload. So what we are going to cover today um, First, a quick overview of confidential computing. That's a repeat for folks who were uh, faithful and were there this morning. Uh, then we are going to show how to access a guest memory to steal secrets. Uh, we are going to set up a confidential host, which is extre extremely simple, as you'll see. Uh, then we'll try to set up a confidential VM, and uh, hopefully everything happens as we expect. Then we'll discuss some limits of memory protection. Uh, we'll talk very quickly about continental VMs, for instance, on Azure and other places, but Vitaly explained everything about that this morning, so uh, there's a better talk. And uh, uh, things like confidential clusters as well, with a quick example uh, of SLS con constellation. And continental containers, I'll probably have to skip for time reasons. And there is a workshop on Sunday where we'll show you how to do that in practice. So you're welcome to join the workshop for containers. So the problem statement is how to protect data in use, that is data in memory. And we use, uh, so uh, the problem is that conf confidentiality is really the essence of trust. And um, it's broken right now in the cloud because your infrastructure essentially sees your data. So the software that you have runs on the cloud, also now known as someone else's computer. Um, and the hardware resources there are uh, owned by that host. You don't really buy for this memory or whatever. You just rent it. You run various workloads on it, so that's typically some things like containers. Uh, it can be virtual machines, it can be other things. And we have many mechanisms in Linux, protected memory, uh, fruits, all these kind of things are designed to protect the host from the workloads. The other way around, nobody really cared about. In other words, someone who has root access on the host can fully look at the files for your containers, look inside the memory, and so on. And so that means that if you have competitors on the same hardware, they tend to not be very at ease to put really confidential stuff there because nothing tells them that their competitor did not pay the sysadmin more than they did. And so in the end, maybe their data is being shared. So we have solutions for data on disk or data in transit, networking, etc., uh, so that the host essentially cannot really know what you have when you use an encrypted uh, volume, for instance, normally you're safe. For memory, it's a different problem. And there's tons of secrets that run there. And uh, these secrets, well, you know, they may be transient, that may be moving fast, but you can still extract pretty much anything from it if you're, you know how to look. And so what confidential computing first added was a way to encrypt memory. And the encryption is not necessarily super strong, which is why I'm not using a super strong encryption there either. Uh, but it's very fast, it happens on every write to memory, and so it really offers some serious protection anyway. And then... So you mentioned that the encryption suite also includes this house key. So what prevents the house from just taking a snapshot of the memory and breaking the weak encryption slot? Can I take that question at the end? Uh, that's an excellent question. The short answer to that is that um, the encryption is really normally not visible to the host at all and dependent on the page, dependent on the lo location and other aspects that make it in practice hard to break. What, what could be work well would be replay attacks on a given uh, page, for instance. That, that would work better because that encryption uh, mechanism would be the same for that page. But we, we can take that later. That's, that's a very good question. And when I say weak, it's not super weak either, right? It's, it's still relatively serious. So there is also integrity protection for the CPU state, uh, essentially to make sure that the hypervisor cannot 
uh, make your workload do whatever they want by changing the address uh, of execution or some registers in the CPU state. And one thing that I covered extensively this morning was proving that what you run is what you want through mechanisms known as attestation, and that gives you some cryptographic counties about what you're running. Okay, so let's go to some real meat. So this morning was sort of a joke uh, uh, presentation. Today we are going to look at a real system, and I would have liked to do that live, but I explained in a moment why I did not do it live, so I'm going to comment what I recorded. So we have a Fedora 38 system. Uh, it has a relatively recent Linux, uh, 6 to 14. And um, it's, it's uh, running with uh, 16 uh, uh, CPUs. Uh, so that's an epic 16 core. Um, so that's a relatively serious machine with SCB and SCB SNP available on it. That's, that's what I'm going to use for this, this demo today. So, in terms of, uh, I don't know, it's like there was a noise. So, in terms of uh, what the machine looks like when you remote connect, so that really depends on the machine, but you have uh, typically a web access like this, and you can look, for instance, at BIOS settings when it starts. Uh, that's the good old fashioned way of doing it, so I'm going to skip a li little forward in the, the setup. You can access the BIOS the old ways uh, with you know, hitting the F12 or F2 or whatever, it depends on the machine. What matters there is that we are going to look at, uh, uh, at the, the processor settings and check that we have uh, secure nested paging enabled. So you can see that at the bottom of the. So that's essentially the thing that really matters in your configuration there. And of course, the way you do that depends on, on the machine you use. So the rest is not specifically interesting. You just have to be relatively up to date with firmware because these technologies are relatively new and so older firmware may have various issues. Okay, so nothing really, really special otherwise. We can boot the machine and uh, look at the virtual console, the, the, the virtual console and uh, you get you know, just your regular text-only mode Linux. This uh, also support graphical mode. So the more modern way of doing that is to go through the web interface like this. So you have, as always, the, the place depends on where you are, but you have system settings, and you can see again that you have your secure list of paging somewhere in the middle there. I scrolled too fast, but it's, uh, it, it's a, a bit above. So do you see it's a secure memory encryption, secure nested paging at the bottom of the page. Okay, so I think that's about for this, this page. So we can check uh, that we have some host level SCV support uh, simply by looking at the message log. And uh, uh, that's essentially all we can do without additional software. There. Okay, so. In order to be able to do some kind of demo, I, I'll have to uh, use a little bit of extra, so extra software, and I'm trying to uh, give a sort of shout out to uh, KCLI, which is a relatively convenient tool to do various things. So you enable a special copper for that, and then you, you install what you need. And I forgot one of the packages is there, which is libvirt QMU client. So nothing really complicated, but you need essentially a hypervisor, a manager for that. So you're not very surprised so far, I guess. So now we can check with self cuddle we can check a little more about what our machine has inside. So it has support for SCV, SCV ES, and SCV SNP, and now you know, all know what this means. We also need to record these uh, numbers that we have there, the number of uh, physical bits reduction, the C-bit location, and stuff like that. Uh, we'll need that later. So let's just remember for now, 51.5, that's we can also check that uh, the, we, ha we have a kernel that has enabled uh, uh, the AMD support, and we can check that our libvirt also has support for this kind of, uh, of features. Uh, so the, the DOM capabilities will tell us if there is an SCV section in there, then your libvirt also has support for that. So this is um, essentially the, a, a pre-flight check to, to, to be sure that your machine has what you need. 
And again, we have this uh, reduced face bits and the 51. And of course, you can now notice that the, re the, the, the number of reduced face bits is not the same between the two. And you're starting to scratch your head and say, OK, something in there does not cook. Ah, well, which one will I use? We'll see. <laughs> OK, it doesn't. So KCLI, uh, I, I assume most of you don't really know how this, uh, what KCLI is. It's a sort of uh, a quick user interface to create VMs, create clusters, um, and it has various backends. It can use libvert, it can use. Um, so here I'm going to use libvert, and so I, I create a default pool for that. I essentially reset that machine uh, initially before doing all that, um, except I, have, I forgot to reset the network. So. Let me just delete the network, reset, recreate, so that you can see how you get started uh, setting up a special network for your machines. And um, we can skip a little. OK, and now I have no VM. And these are the images I played with. Uh, one interesting thing with KCLI is you can list all the available images. And you see there is a number. And that's, for me, the best tool, for instance, to install things like Arcos or RHEL compared to the others. It saves you a few steps in terms of being able to deploy this kind of operating systems. So this is essentially the basics for, for what you can do with it. So we are going to, um, in a first run, create a regular VM and steal data from it. So to run a VM, you use the KCLI create VM. Uh, the dash I is I want the Fedora 38 image, I want four CPUs, and I want four gigs of memory. And I'm going to pass a root password, which is one of the secrets I'm going to look for. So please remember that secret. We'll, we'll use it later. So now I connect to my console, and I check that the machine boots. So far, it looks good. I'm happy with it, right? And you see that there is some cloud init magic happening behind my back. I log in, I type Strumpf, uh, which is the French for Strumpf. And, um, and KCLI already sets up for me uh, SSH and stuff like that. So, so that means instead of going through the serial console, I can use a more serious tool and uh, use SSH because now you, you know, we, we really care about secrecy and stuff like that. So I'm going to SSH into my test VM. And uh, you see that I'm user of header other. So KCLI has this idea that depending on the image, it can actually create a user for you and do not, do not necessarily look, uh, log in as root. Uh, but you can also log as root. And we're going to do that to check that there is no SCV inside. So no SCV support in this VM, the way I created it, just a regular thing. And um, let's try to now inject a typical C program in there so that's high quality C code. QE told me you'd better run that in a VM, please. <laughs> so <laughs> they told me there is a bug or two in there. I don't know. Doesn't look, looks good to me when I compile, compiled. There's barely a little one <laughs> or two. <laughs> so let me copy that to my VM. So I have the SCP command as well. That's fine. And, uh, and I, I connect to it. And then I'm going to run. And of course, it's going to run perfectly well, like any C program. So it's not exactly what I expected. That's not the message I put in there, but close enough. Ship it. <laughs> OK, so, so now I have this, uh, this program. And I'm going to, to uh, do something slightly more complicated. So this one, I have to look up the documentation every time I want to use it. And I'm going to dump the memory of the guest. So that's why there is a pause there, because I'm thinking, OK, where is my documentation? Where do I copy paste this stuff? So, oh, and also because I discovered at this time that reinstalling everything caused me to lose my completions. That's also because. I <laughs> so uh, I'm using to use the. I'm going to use the QMU monitor command, and execute a dump guest memory. And the arguments are, you know, it's it's very user friendly. It has all the quotes and backslash and qu and uh, curly braces you want. Um, and I'm going to use a protocol, which is file colon something to dump to a file, which why not just file colon? Well, I don't know. But it's essentially I'm dumping the memory of my guest into um, this place. You can also do something like gcore. Uh, if you do that, you're going to have some other stuff than the guest memory. So that's why it's better to do it that way. 
And you see this disconnected from QMU system is, doesn't look really good. In reality, I, that's probably why my machine ended up being a bit screwed, but we'll see later. So now I can drip for my secrets. That was in my C program. And you see, I have a match. So let me check with Emacs what I see inside my guest memory. Emacs is being completely designed to open four gig files. So it takes a few seconds to open. It does warn me, you know, four gig is big. Do you really want to do that? But then it displays the stuff the way it should be displayed with tons of zeros control, uh, 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 control at. And now I look for secret and I find my, hey, really secret stuff right in there. So my C program does not emit that message, but at least I see it in the memory. So I know I did load the right program. Now, what if I search for my Strumpf password? Well, of course, I find this as well. And I, I find it in this nice little snippet of script. So hey, that's perfectly unsafe. I'm happy because that's sort of what I wanted to demonstrate, right? So success. For uh, some definition of success, of course. <laughs> so let's try to fix that. And you'll see that it's really, really super easy. Don't worry. So let's first try to make our VM compatible with what you need for, um, for continuous computing. So unfortunately, KCLI still creates old style VMs. So I have to change the hardware to say I want a more recent Q35 stuff. So let me do that. I replace PCI, uh, PC4400, uh, 440FX with QMU, and then it complains because, oh, now I need PCI. OK, so let me fix that too. So I need to fix my devices. Uh, the good thing about uh, uh, Libvirt is that it checks tons of stuff for you, and then it complains about the addresses being wrong. So I just remove everything. It's going to recompute a set of addresses that match. It usually works. And, um, and the next thing I need to do is replace my SATA disk with SCSI disk. And normally, I should be more or less uh, in a good shape after that. So what I'm doing here is only trying to make my machine compatible with the kind of hardware I need for virtual machine. So OK. Um, now, I forgot something. And it's, it's uh, you know, I mentioned the, the SCSI stuff, and I just did not do it. So let, let me fix that. And that's because the devices you are going to pass in your VM need to be protected somewhere. So you need to have IOMMU active everywhere. And to have IOMMU active, you essentially need to convert to Virtaio SCSI and stuff like that. So that's what I'm doing here, converting to Virtaio SCSI. And everything should be pitchy. OK, so let's start my VM and check that it's still alive. Come on, don't do typos. So my AI is typing. That's why it's sometimes making typos. OK, so the VM looks good. And I can still connect. And of course, um, I still don't have any kind of SCB. I did not activate that yet. But at least the VM has a, the, the right kind of hardware. So I need to do tons of VM edits like this. And it's well documented in Libvirt, uh, on the Libvirt org uh, page. So you see that, for instance, that's why I took the Q35 idea and things like that. But it also tells me I need to change the bootloader. And I need to um, I, I do some adjustments to the memory. So we are going to do that. Let me skim a bit quickly in that. So you, you need to boot with uh, um, OVMF, so UEFI. And um, uh, you need to do some adjustments to, to the memory. You need to do some adjustments to the network. This is all relatively well documented. Let's skip relatively quickly through this, because it's not necessarily the most interesting part of the talk. But it tells you what I'm spending my days on, right? Who doesn't love that? OK, so I follow these instructions, and I keep churning and churning. And I try to start it again. And uh, that's why I got my first Libvirt hang. That's why I knew that something was, so oh, forget that. Restart. Just restart some demons, and I can start my VM again. Uh, 
and now it boots in UEFI. So that, steps look, that step looks good. Uh, I'm still not completely there. Of course, I still have not enabled SCV. So you're starting to think maybe this is taking a bit longer. Maybe this is not the best way. So uh, before I can actually activate SCV, I need to uh, activate it on the host and endorse it. So to do that, uh, first let me give you a bit of terminology because AMD is very light on acronyms. So ARK stands for AMD root key. ASK stands not for ASK, but for AMD SCV key. CE key is a chip endorsement key. OCA is the owner's certificate authority. PEK is the platform endorsement key. PDS is the platform Diffie Hellman key. Uh, you need to know all of this, and there will be a question at the end. I ask question at the end. <laughs> okay. Oh, and there are more, two more, like the tick and the tech, and uh, you can read. <laughs> okay, so let me do my host setup. Let me first reset everything, and uh, let's verify the host. And you see that I, ha I have this nice chain. So this morning I taught you about uh, uh, the root of trust and maintaining the, the chain of trust. You got a good example there with this signs this and, and, and certifies that, etc. And if I run it twice, I get the same uh, results for PDH, PK, and OCA, which you remember what it means. If I do a reset though, I'm going to get different numbers this time. So you see that the, the PDH has changed. And transparently, SCVCTL is actually talking to somewhere at AMD, which I learned the hard way when their server was no longer responding to the, the requests. So uh, notice also that the AMD root key, fortunately, did not change when I did a <laughs> reprovisioning of the system. So that's what you do when you, you reprovision the system. OK, so that looks good. Uh, now I'm going to do the guest setup. So the guest setup is primarily adding a launch security step to certify the virtual machine as confidential. And you'll see it's really easy. So it's all well explained on the document here. That's the, uh, the um, XML you need to put. So I need to find a place to put it in my code. And I, yeah, that's, that's why I'm going to put that stuff. And that's, oh. Uh, this is where my CBIT pass and stuff matter. I need to put them there, and I need to select whether I want to put one or five. Apparently, both work, so. <laughs> there, there were some discussions on what exactly was supposed to be there. So I've got my launch security se uh, section, but it's not sufficient because I need to have actual keys in there. So in order to do that, I need to create a security session. So first, I will export my PDH, which is the OK, everyone, platform if you had man, yeah? So, and then I'm going to just check that it works with this setup. And then uh, I'm uh, going to generate uh, the, the files that describe a given session for a VM. So now that's related to that specific VM. Normally, you would use the host name there because you can transport this data to some other place, but I'm going to keep it simple. Just use host.pdh and do everything local. Normally, you can do that remotely. And the policy is helpfully explained in chapter three of some obscure document somewhere on AMD website. It's also on a different page on the libvirt documentation. And you essentially have to orbit mask for stuff that's modern style, you know, 1980s style of user interface. So now I've created my session. And what this did is create a few files that all begin with this, that VM. So there is this God mode thing. Um, there is a tech, a tick, and a tag, and a session, and all the stuff. <laughs> so that looks good. Um, I can probably make some progress from there. And put that stuff inside my file. So I'm going to insert where there is DH site. So DH should remind you, of course, that it's PDH. It's the same thing. So you insert the copy of the file there. And then you insert the copy of the session file in the session section. Uh, I think that makes sense. I mean, that's simple. That's a good user interface. Use Emacs, use VI, whatever. I mean, it's just text. There is some l remarkably low entropy on, on this se sequence of A's there that I find really surprisingly low. <laughs> I don't know why exactly. <laughs> that's something I, I like to look into, why there are so many A's. 
Okay, so now that's edited. And I'm going to do it the SCV old style way, SCV, SCV, ES. I'm not going to try remote attestation because that's complicated. So we'll keep the simple stuff here. Um, and so what we do essentially now is um, that we are going to enter a brave new secure world where we are completely protected. So to launch the secure VM, the first step is to start the VM, but you start it in post mode because reasons. The reason is you, you have to check before you actually launch it. That's called pre-attestation. Remember, I, I explained that this morning. So you have to check that it passes the test before you let it go. Then you do this DOM launch sec info test VM that gives you a measurement of what you are trying to launch. And then you need to validate it with this helpful tool where you just have to copy paste the output of the previous command, but of course with different option names like everything that begins with SCV does not begin with SCV on the command line. Other than that, it's, it's fairly simple. You do that, and you try to not typo too, mu typo too much. Oh, you have to measure the firmware, so you have to tell where the firmware is. And with that stuff, it looks pretty Linuxy to me so far, right? <laughs> now I'm going to, to get my, my grade for Okay, and I get this nice answer. Looks good to me. So now I'm allowed to resume a VM. I can say, hey, resume, console, and let's go. And what happens? So booting again into EFI. So what should happen there? I should see a CV, and I should be able to run my application without its content being visible. That's what I expect. So I do that. I connect, I type Stromf, which is no, no longer so, so much of a secret, and I have a CV. Success. I'm really happy. Memory encryption features active. Yay! Let me SSH into it from another window and run my little test program. So let me copy the latest version where I upgraded nothing. I don't know why I need to copy it. I think because I, in, the, in, in the meantime, I recreated a VM from scratch. So I run it. It works just as well as before. And now I'm going to do my memory dump like before. But now I have it in the history, so it's easier. And I take the encrypted version. What do you expect? OK, well, same error message, same thing. But so let me now grab it. Ta -da -ta -da. <laughs> that is a pretty. <laughs> huh. Let's look with Emacs. <laughs> Something is wrong there. <laughs> hmm. And I have to wait to see why it's bogus. OK, let me go slightly faster. And the reason for that is that we see the word secret as part of some file system stuff, which is already, I'm already scratching my head. But I don't actually have my secret stuff with 3F. It's not there. So something is working. I have protected somewhere, something. But if I look for Strumpf, Oh, OK. Who can tell me what I did wrong? I scratched my head. I thought, you know, maybe it's something on the console that is going wrong. So I'd say if you can't answer, if nobody in this room can answer, it means I'm not the only one being stupid. So you're all as stupid as I am, because I had to scratch my head for a while to figure out where did I go wrong? What did I do incorrectly? No, it's much simpler than that. So I double check, SCV is there. Is it the same? No. Hmm. <laughs> we have a problem. If you have not seen the what talk, you search Google, you, you search Google talk, what talk right now, you watch this. Okay, so it's time to tell the boss. 
dear boss, <laughs> my demo for next week doesn't work. Which is why I completely changed compared to what I was supposed to talk about. Dear Ariel, um, I have a problem. <laughs> doesn't, I do see pieces of my secrets in there, and I'm not sure why. So that was my secret. The first experiment was with Tic Tac Toe Toto, screenshot, SCB is active. Answer <laughs> from my boss. Isn't that the punchline? <laughs> Aren't you supposed to protect from that? Hmm. Okay. So the reason for that is that only memory is encrypted. What I did wrong, if, you, if, you, if I grab, grab the stuff from my, my program, it's not there. That stuff is not visible. That part we succeeded with. However, when you do uh, encrypted memory like this, you cannot send that to disk directly, right? You cannot write to a network directly. So all the I.O. buffers that are being used by the kernel have to have the famous C bit clear, saying it's not encrypted. Which means that you'd better encrypt your disk. <laughs> right? And that's the thing I forgot about KCLI, is that by default it uses, <laughs> you know, it uses good old um, cloud in it, and there is no encryption of the disk setup by default. So we need tools, and we need to build tools to keep that complexity and reduce the risk of misconfiguration. So first of all, how did I get there? You can blame Wayner over there. I'm pointing fingers there, because I'm also doing a workshop in two days with Wayner, and, yeah, and his workshop was about um, I know it's Q&A, but it's the last, day, last session of the day, so I have a little extra time. So I have too many talks going, and he did a, a remarkable series of scripts for this lab, and he was using KCLI all over the place, and I said, ah, that makes it really shorter compared to what I was planning to present. So let me use KCLI. And I switched to KCLI and did not realize it was not encrypting until the very last step. So step one, prepare a list of comments for a live demo. Step two, prepare another workshop with Winner. Step three, notice that this workshop uses KCLI. Step four, think, ah, great idea, I'll use that too. Step five, record a movie with all the planned steps, but where you replace carefully all the steps where you were creating encrypted VMs with a fun, uh, a fun installation with KCLI. Totally forget that KCLI does not encrypt disks. Success. So that's how you fail spectacularly in public. Now, there are better ways, and I'm going to show them. Uh, that should be for another talk. You can set up VMs in the cloud. Um, that was uh, at 10.30 this morning with, uh, uh, with Vitaly. Uh, we, you can use uh, confidential containers. That's the talk we have tomorrow. Uh, on Sunday, sorry. Uh, and you can deploy complete clusters, which I'm going to show on the next slide with a tool like Constellation, for instance, which is careful to set up the VMs the right way for you. It's just that it would not fit in the 30 minutes that are still allotted to me after the end of the talk. And so, so essentially you wait and you wait and you wait and after something like 40, 50 minutes, you get a cluster which is really set up the right way. So this is uh, the recommended way to go if you, go, if you want to really spend your money uh, if you have too much cash on hand and you're ready to pay for all your VMs and all your control plane and everything to be encrypted, go with it. That's very easy. It then, then behaves like your regular, uh, your regular um, cluster. Sorry, <laughs> getting tired a little bit. So then you can connect to a node and check that it's encrypted prob properly, that the disk is encrypted, etc. And of course, we are working uh, on this for Fedora and CoreOS. So what you see here is the creation of a Fedora CoreOS disk with ignition, with a secret injected, and that gets encrypted um, uh, on the fly as the ignition step happens. And I have to thank Timothée Ravier for helping me doing that this morning. <laughs> this is relatively new to the talk. Now it's time for questions, if, if there is any. Oh, there is no time for questions, but. <laughs> so 
So the question is, a, yeah, the, the, the question is about what is the cost of uh, memory encryption, mostly, right? Um, and so in terms of power usage, it's hard to tell because it's not exactly the same generation of processors. So if you do processors with more, more transistors but they are smaller, then maybe it's not consuming that much. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that using encryption in, uh, uh, adds much in terms of consumption of memory. Uh, sorry, of uh, energy. What it, and it does not add latency. We did some measurements, and in terms of latency compared to non-encrypted, it's the same speed. However, on the same CPU. Uh, however, what it adds cost is that you cannot do any kind of deduplication. You cannot deduplicate your disks because they are encrypted. You cannot deduplicate your container images because now you want to download them from inside, inside your virtual machines. So you're downloading the same thing over and over again. And you cannot do any kind of KSM or anything with encrypted memory anyway. Uh, don't ask me. <laughs> so the question was, when do we get cheap hardware? Why does it not consume power? Because, well, I get it that it doesn't need to use latency and, and stuff because it's separate hardware and it's to the core. But that thing has to do something. And yeah, so. Has to be done. So to be precise, yeah, to be precise, I think it does consume a little bit of power. But when you see that you have chips that consume 100 watt or 130 watt of TDP, I'm sure there is half a watt in there that is encryption, but I don't think it's more than that. Well, I would have expected that the bandwidth of the memory is so high. Yeah, the, the, reason cheap, the reason I think it's, it's, cheap, it's, cheap, it's cheap, cheap, the reason I think it's cheap is that my, my phone does it on a battery for a whole day. So, so it keeps encrypting stuff all the time uh, when it's communicating, and they, ha they accelerated in hardware all the encryption with the network and so on. Precisely because the hardware could do it relatively cheaply. And the, the network stuff, encryption, yeah. doesn't cost too much. And the, the disk encryption doesn't cost too much. I get that. Yeah, but, but to be fair, you've got the wrong Din Shan. Uh, you, you've got the wrong Din Shan. My brother, Flora, is the hardware guy in the family. <laughs> I have a brother who does you know, FPGAs and stuff like that. He could tell you everything about how much it costs to encrypt stuff. I can't. Sorry. <laughs> and, and back to your question, you know, when does that become mainstream? I'd say, as usual, it will probably take you know, a decade. So. The feedback we got so far is that there are a few markets that are already interested today because they have to deal with regulations constraining the kind of their responsibility in terms of data leaks, and that's banks, medical, stuff like that. But also that because this becomes available, of course, the manufacturers, manufacturers are lobbying all, all they can to make this mandatory. And so now it becomes a lot that you have to encrypt your data that way. Uh, and so maybe they will, you know, in some cases you won't have a choice. Maybe they will drop these uh, regulations that the data may not, may not travel outside forever when this is being done. Mm. Time will tell. We'll see. We'll see how this works. So the meat has <laughs> No, so, so. When, I, when I'm saying it's weak is that it's typically done to be done in real time. Uh, it's still modern algorithms and uh, the, the, the algorithms they use are dependent on a chip. And frankly, off the top of my head, I don't recall which one they use, but I think they have AES uh, uh, 128 somewhere in, in, at some level for the first generation chips. And now they are doing more complicated stuff. So, so it's... Um, it's not the stuff that you can break with your computer without paying a lot of energy. And um, by the way, I suspect that one reason that triggered these efforts is, I don't know if you recall, like uh, almost 10 years ago, there was this big 
push about memory stores and uh, persistent memory, non-volatile RAM, and, and this kind of things. And everybody at the time thought uh, that we'd have really cheap non-volatile memory one decade la later, so that's now. And so the problem became for the chip vendors, I need to make sure that if someone plugs one of these non-volatile chips, they don't get all the data that was in there. So that was probably a primary motivation to get started on this encryption stuff initially. And in that space, so it had to be relatively robust anyway. So I apologize for the use of the word weak. I meant it's not as strong as you could do if you were really pushing the limits on your crypto, but it's, it's pretty good. I'm out of time. I knew. I knew that. <laughs>